Hello and welcome to Story Untold. I'm Martin Bauman and my guest today is a Vanier scholar studying cognitive neuroscience at the University of Waterloo. Robin Mazumder is his name. He's been named one of Edmonton's top 40 under 40. He's been a guest librarian at the Kitchener Public Library. And he's studying what it means for our mental health to be living in cities. It's an area that could really change the way we think of the space around us. He's been a catalyst for change in Edmonton. He brought light therapy lamps to the libraries there and also in Kitchener. He's also brought pop-up bike lanes to the city of Edmonton. Before all of that, he was an occupational therapist dealing with his own depression and seeing similar issues in the patients he was working with. Here's his story. Robin, you study the psychological impacts of urban design. How would you explain that to somebody? I guess I'm really curious about how living in a city impacts your mental health. And that interest comes from my first-hand clinical experience working as an occupational therapist. And I worked in the downtown cores of cities for about five years with people with various mental health issues. And during that time, I just really wondered how, if and how, living in a city exacerbated people's mental health issues or caused them. And so now I'm doing my PhD um, in cognitive neuroscience, where we're using some really interesting equipment to measure people's response to different elements of the built environment. So yeah, basically, we're looking at how urban design shapes the way that you feel. And what are you finding so far? Is it too early for you to come to any conclusions like that? Yeah, so it's interesting. We do a number of different things in our lab. So we do in-lab studies where we use virtual reality to measure Uh, to build virtual cityscapes, which allows us to really manipulate the variables a lot easier than physically building buildings and whatnot of a downtown core. And in those studies, one of the studies I'm looking at right now is is examining how people feel when they're surrounded by skyscrapers. And that's based on an urban planning study done at Harvard about four years ago. And they didn't do any physiological measurements. They just suggested that people feel this quality of what they call oppressiveness. They feel oppressed by tall buildings. And so in that study right now, I'm not done the study, so it's not, I, I can't give any conclusive results, but it would suggest that when people are, are in the presence of very tall buildings, that there is a physiological response that would indicate that they're stressed out. We also do other research that's in the community. So we complement the in-lab stuff with real-world research. And last September, September 2016, I was in Vancouver where I worked with the Happy City team on an experiment where we measured how people responded to actual spaces in downtown Vancouver. And we actually just released a report with them, uh, which you can find on their website. And some of the results would suggest that simple interventions like painting a crosswalk, a rainbow color, or putting green spaces and alleyways was a simple way to make people happier and more at ease. And ultimately, behind all this research, whether it's in a lab or on the street, we're looking at stress, but I'm more interested in in how that experience of stress or how these experiences of happiness make us more social because social connection is what keeps us healthy in cities. So, I mean, what you're suggesting is that urban planners should really think of themselves in a way as part of the health care team of, of any given community. How do you see them fitting into the picture? Yeah, so that's something I've been advocating for for quite some time. Ever since I became involved in urbanism, I was first involved in urbanism when I was an occupational therapist. And I was like, you guys play such a huge role. I saw the day-to-day, the impacts it had on the day-to-day lives of my clients and their health. And so I think what urban planners can do is see themselves, like you said, as a part of the healthcare team and really reflect on how their decisions impact both physical and and mental health of people. I think it's particularly important because once you do something, once you build something, once you build a roadway or widen a roadway or build a building, that's kind of there, you know, unless there's a huge earthquake that, that starts you at scratch, the decisions that urban planners make and politicians make when it comes to the built environment are are very permanent. So it's really important to think about those health impacts. What I think is interesting to me is that part of the research you're doing in studying psychological impacts of of this urban environment, you could argue that a lot of what your findings could be is negatives of what a city can do to a person, the stressors. And yet you are a dedicated urbanist and, and looking for ways of making a city 
into a village or a community, so to speak. What's that sort of struggle like for you? Or tell me about your passion for what a city can be. Yeah, so I've been really lucky to live in a number of cities, even since I was a kid. My dad's a professor, so we moved around a lot. And so I've been able to see across my lifespan so far what a city can be. And I also think it's important to recognize that it's just inevitable. When we're looking at the stats, 80% of Canadians live in cities, and that number is only going to grow. On a global scale, 50% of the world's population lives in cities, and that number is only going to grow. We're becoming an increasingly urbanized world. And so because I care about people, and that's what took me to healthcare originally, I think it's really important, and, and that's what drives my passion. I just think that there's more to a city than I think we have thought of in the past. And I'm just trying to uncover that and also give give the planners and the policymakers the data that they need to make the decisions. Because I think on an intuitive level, a lot of the stuff that we find in our lab or in, in the community where we do our research, it's kind of common sense. You know, you'd expect that these decisions or these, these interventions, um, these design interventions would have positive effects. But when it comes to cities and municipalities, they're under more strenuous pressure to make data informed decisions. And so all of those things combined is what really makes me passionate and passionate enough to de- dedicate the next four years of my life to studying that. Uh, you mentioned uh, a bit of moving around as you were growing up. Tell me about uh, that early influence for you, uh, what the early years were like for you. Yeah. So I spent most of my childhood in Montreal and We lived in the South Shore, which was in Greenfield Park in a small suburb outside of the core. But both my parents worked at universities in downtown Montreal. And I just remember being on the subway or like getting getting out from Greenfield Park, jumping on the subway in Longay and then ending up in downtown Montreal and just being amazed by like these the huge buildings I saw around me, the hustle and bustle. And it was actually like some of my favorite memories are when my mom would take me to the museum downtown and we'd go to the parade. And I think what from like the perspective of a kid I just appreciated how chaotic it was you know and there's a beauty to that chaos there's sometimes as we know it can be negative aspects to that chaos as well so yeah I think that was that was something that had a lasting impact on me and also as a child I went to like Calcutta and New Delhi which are mega cities and I just saw I saw that and so I think a lot of these experiences in cities as a kid and throughout my life have really driven my interest and I think even more recently I mean I moved to Toronto to do my master's from Victoria uh, where I so I spent the second half of my formative years in Victoria BC moving there from Montreal and then I moved to Toronto and I was just in love I became I fell in love with that city I fell in love with again that that vibrancy and that chaos and so I just love what cities can offer and I think if we're intentional and thoughtful about it then they can be places that are healthy and happy. You mentioned already being an occupational therapist. Before that, you went to school for biology. That was your undergrad. Yeah. Uh, what was the plan back then, or was there a plan for, for that undergrad? Yeah, you know, um, my dad's a biologist, <laughs> and I, I kind of grew up in labs, and I really wasn't too sure about what I wanted to do for my undergrad. To be perfectly honest, I was kind of a daydreamer in high school, and I almost didn't end up getting into my undergrad program. I I snuck in because computer science had a lower average of entry, um, and then I switched over to biology the second I got into the school. My original plan was, I think like many young Indo-Canadians, was med school. You know, it's something that you kind of hear, and my, my uncle is an amazing person, and he was a doctor, and I saw what he did and was really inspired by that. So I did biology, took all the necessary prereqs that it would take to become a physician. And somewhere along the line, I think I got a little disenchanted by it. I really wasn't too sure if I wanted to be in, be a doctor. And I actually took a year off after my undergrad, and I did a bunch of stuff. I worked for a nonprofit organization. And actually, I should mention, while I was doing my undergrad ed- education, I worked a lot with kids with disabilities as in, in, in inclusion, community inclusion. And I realized, like, that's what kind of fired me up. I did my classes just because I had to, but I was, I'd always look forward to, like, the after school programs I'd run or the summer camps that I'd t- take these kids to. Like, that's what really made me happy. And then I ended up getting a desk job at a nonprofit organization as a research analyst. And this organization was disability oriented well as well. And the executive director saw that I wasn't 
particularly inclined to desk work at that point in my life. And he said, hey, have you ever thought of occupational therapy? You know, and so he kind of, I never really thought much about it. I didn't really know what it was. And I also spent four months working in Siberia with kids with disabilities there. And I saw what occupational therapists did in this small town in Siberia for these kids. And so I came back and basically in the course of like a month, I applied for OT school. And and so my undergrad education was interesting because I'm, I'm interested in a lot of things. And so I really took all the opportunities I could to take classes from everything but science. So I did philosophy. I did medical anthropology. You know, I took psychology classes. And, and so, yeah, the, my undergrad education was really more, I think, a process and trying to figure myself out. And serendipitously, I guess I found out about occupational therapy. Can we talk about Siberia for a bit? Uh, what that experience was like, uh, what the community was like that you went to uh, and what you were doing? Yeah, so that was like, I think that might be one of the craziest things that's happened in my life. So I I was finishing up my undergrad degree and my best friend, Sean, had approached me. He's like, hey man, like, what are we going to do this summer? You know, um, uh, one of my profs, and Sean was in Russian and Slavonic studies, and one of his professors said, hey, like, there's this Canadian International Development Agency grant they give to students to go and forge relationships with people in Slavic countries. And and so he said, hey, like you, you work with kids with disabilities, like maybe we can like drum up some idea. And so we kind of made this hack plan of working with an orphanage in, in this town called Kantimansis in Siberia, where we'd go and help basically promote the inclusion of youth with disabilities within that orphanage. And we, you know, we put the proposal together and this was in April and I didn't really have much faith. I was like, okay, like I got nothing better to do. Let's, let's just give it a shot. A month later, we got an email from CETA saying that they're giving us $10,000 to go to Russia, which we had planned on going in June. So it was just that the whole process of getting there in itself was just kind of harrowing and, and chaotic. But when we got there, it, I think it was a, definitely a formative experience for me, you know, um, you, you spend four years in, in somewhat of a womb in university and then you get thrust into like Siberia and Russia. I mean, I was terrified before I went. I heard all these horror stories about, you know, racism and I didn't wasn't sure if I'd be safe there. And when I got there, I was just amazed by the people. And it was three months. I would almost say it was a coming of age experience. It was three months where I was taken completely out of my element. And I think that I think that experience of being taken away from everything you know helps distill who you are and kind of recalibrates you. And so over the course of those three months, we worked really closely with a group of parents and their children who all had various disabilities like cerebral palsy and autism. And honestly, like, I don't think, I mean, I think this is probably a dilemma a lot of people in development experience where are you, are you going to do something that's sustainable or are you just going to show up do do something for your own good and then leave these people in a situation that is perhaps even worse than where you started and all we did was really help connect these people who were fairly disconnected because of stigma in russian society around disability they weren't they didn't feel safe taking their kids to the park a number of them had experienced verbal physical violence from people who, uh, who didn't have respect for them or their children and so what we did when we went there is we just found a way for these people to get connected and I guess the only other thing I should add was our whole idea of working with the orphanage never worked out we got to Siberia and we found out that these kids that we were supposed to work with at the orphanage were in Sochi at a summer camp for the summer so we had to find people to work with and so then through this crazy process we were connected with the community of families with kids with disabilities and by the end of the summer they all knew each other and they felt comfortable going on in the community and that to me seemed like a success because now they have a sustainable way of developing community connections but also they've they've got a support system so that was that chapter you get a chance to reassess where you're at and how you want to devote your life and you get into occupational therapy what were those years like in that time like uh being an occupational therapist yeah, so I would say again an uh, occupational therapy school was definitely another formative experience for me. To be perfectly honest, the first year of my program I was severely depressed. I mean, I've dealt with mental health issues my whole life and that was a particularly rocky time for me. And what's interesting is when you're working in the context of healthcare, 
and you're, we're talking about mental health and we're talking like we're taking classes on mental health and I'm realizing that I want to focus as an occupational therapist in mental health. It was just a really interesting time of self-reflection of like, I don't know if the wounded healer archetype is something that I'd, would be as accurate but it was just this interesting thing where i was trying to work through my own issues and also become someone that would help other people with those sorts of issues and so ot school was really fascinating to me occupational therapists can work in any field uh of of healthcare. so some work in stroke some work in insurance and i just chose mental health because it just resonated with me so so yeah ot school really changed again obviously changed my life by giving me a vocation but also just the experience in itself and living in Toronto and you know all of our community placements when we were, when we were in school were in downtown Toronto so I got to work at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health I worked in a boarding home and all these I was put in a lot of situations I never thought I'd be in and and so then yeah it set me up to, to work in as an occupational therapist and I spent some time working as a full OT at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in downtown Toronto and I worked on a, a schizophrenia inpatient unit and that was like baptism by fire it was a really really intense environment and then from there I moved to Edmonton and I spent four years working in uh, community mental health I worked with kids with mental health issues and then I worked with adults with mental health issues and all that all those experiences I think have led up to what I'm doing now because working as an OT gave me the understanding of a what what mental health really is and how someone's environment can impact that did you find your own lived experience helped in in your line of work being able to whether that was empathize or bring it up as a means of sharing a commonality with someone and then breaking down whatever barriers they might have to allowing themselves to be helped by you yeah i think that i think like i guess uh, in in the clinical work it's called therapeutic use of self or self disclosure and i mean yeah so to your to your first point yeah, for sure. I mean, I can never say that I understand exactly what someone's going through, but I know what it feels like to like not be well. And I know what it feels like to, to not have energy and feel down. And so that gave me a point of reference. I mean, a lot of the people, I was, most of the people I was working with were in much severe circumstances than I was for a number of reasons from a socioeconomic perspective. They were also living in poverty. There were a lot of other issues going on for them. But I think, yeah, I think it really gave me an insight and I don't know that everyone needs insight, but for me, it was helpful. You know, for me, it gave me meaning and it got me through some stuff that was pretty tough because the other thing to think about when you're working as a clinician in mental health and, or perhaps any kind of helping capacity, you're at the risk of burnout. So yeah, those experiences were helpful, but you have to watch how involved you get in someone's life and remember that you're a professional. There are actual new positions out there now, people call peer support workers, where they're, where they're actually paid to sh- share their personal experience. And so it's a fine line that you have to toe. And I think if people are conscious of it, it can be a, a benefit, but there are kind of downfalls to coming in with a lived experience while you're working in mental health. One thing that you've mentioned in past before is your own experience with seasonal affective disorder and uh, what spurred you to do something about that, both in Edmonton and in Kitchener. Tell me about, I guess, your own experience with that and the benefits you found from light therapy and and the process of, of bringing it both to those different cities. Yeah, so so I experience depression, but the winter really exacerbates it. And I realized I needed to do something about it after my first year, first winter in Edmonton. It, like, kicked the crap out of me, <laughs> like... The days are very short um, in Edmonton and and the winters are long. And so I think it became very apparent to me. I guess when you get used to a cycling out of like low mood and normality, you just perhaps get used to it. But I think that particular condition or that circumstance just really, it made it very apparent. So after my first winter in Edmonton, I went to my doctor and I was like, look, like I know myself, I know I have like issues with depression, but winter makes it unbearable and I need some help. And he said, well, you should consider light therapy because it's, you know, considered first line treatment and there's very little risk as opposed to taking, you know, prescription meds and it gets a little bit more complicated. And so I was willing to try that out. And in the process of, of, of researching it, I'm a huge researcher, like I'll research every, anything I buy. So I want to, I want the best. And so I found that the best and most effective light therapy lamps were actually kind of pricey around two, $300. 
And at the time, I was working as an occupational therapist with people living in poverty. And I was like, most of these people could probably use this, but they can barely afford rent. I don't think they can Mm -hmm. muster up $300 to buy a lamp, you know. And so that spurred the idea and and I don't know, the synchronicity of it all. At at the same time, I saw a call for a micro grant called the Austin Foundation. They give out these $1,000 grants for people with community ideas. So I, you know, filled out the form and I got the call from them saying, hey, you're going to pitch. And I was like, well, if I'm going to buy these things, like I got to put them somewhere in public. Where am I going to stick them? And I had like a day to figure that out because I had to pitch with a, some partner organization that mm-hmm. would host these lamps. And I was racking my brain and I'm like, where can I put this? Should I be at the rec center, maybe City Hall? And then it just recurred to me. The library is like the perfect place to put these lamps. I mean, you have to spend about half an hour sitting beside them. What better place than a building full of books than to, to, and also a building that's kind of built on the premise of equity and sharing. They share all sorts of stuff, so why not share light therapy? So basically, I asked Edmonton Public Library if they'd host it, and they agreed. I got the money. I bought three lamps, plugged them in, and that's pretty much all I did, and it seemed to garner a lot of interest, and I think it gave people permission to talk about not feeling well with their mental health. And so there's been, there was a lot of interest. It got some press and, you know, it's since spread all over the country. Toronto Public Libraries picked it up. I'm getting tons of emails now from like the States because the story was covered in a library journal uh, a couple of months ago. And so, you know, it's, it's just growing and growing. And then even bringing it to Kitchener, when I was asked to be the guest librarian, I was like, this is going to be like one of my projects, you know, Mm -hmm. I want to bring this to my community. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, what I love about it is that it's just, it's easy you know, and it's it's literally plug and play. Anyone that wants to can do it. And I reached out to the manufacturer who I purchased these from. They're a Canadian company. And I said, hey, listen, like I got like tons of libraries that are wanting to do this. You know, they're nonprofit organizations. Would you guys give them a discount? And the CEO was like super stoked about it. And so now they're giving them, I think, pretty much at cost to libraries that want to use this uh, resource. So... Yeah, it's been really cool and a bit of a heartwarming experience to see how people receive it. You know, I've gotten good feedback from people who've used the lamps. And I think the other thing that I love about the initiative is that when you're using a light therapy lamp in a public space, you're kind of non-verbally communicating that, you know, you're dealing with some stuff. You're not feeling the best. And I just, I love that because people feel safe enough to do that. And there's a kind of underlying conversation going on that isn't as apparent, I think. It just continues to break down those walls of people being apprehensive of talking about something like that or or feeling as if it's not normal. Yeah. Uh, you know, the other part about the library that's interesting is when you first came here to Kitchener-Waterloo, the first place you went was the library. What do you see as, as the library's role in placemaking and in building a, a community? Yeah, I think the library plays a huge role. It's not just a warehouse for books anymore you know it's it's a community space it's an accessible community space where people from all walks of life can come together i think it's a place where you can brainstorm ideas and it it literally gives you all the resources you would need for things like placemaking and especially in cities something that i was really conscious of when i was working with people with mental health issues who are lonely was there aren't many places that are universally accessible to people, um, a lot of people who work in community inclusion would just take you know their their clients to the mall. That's a corporate space. You know, it's there's everything. It, it's all, it's all it surrounds consumption, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas a library is a place where you just can go hang out and you're welcome and you can read a book and you're not pressured to buy anything. You know, and I think that in itself is something that we should celebrate because I think those sorts of spaces in our communities are fleeting. And I can't think of, to be honest, many. Any other space that can do what the library does, yeah. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about biking and, yeah. and cycling? You're, you're also a very passionate cyclist, and um, one thing that's really interesting that you've done in the past is in Edmonton, you created a series of pop-up bike lanes. Uh, tell me about the, the impetus and what sparked that idea. Yeah, so my first year in Edmonton, I didn't ride my bike because I was terrified. I didn't think it was possible mm-hmm. because I, I moved there from Toronto. I was in Toronto for three years before that. And, and you know, I felt safe as a cyclist in Toronto because it was normal. You see cyclists on the street. And so there was this kind of awareness of cyclists. When I was in Edmonton, I didn't see many cyclists. And 
I was just terrified, so I bought a car. I hadn't owned a car for a while, and I bought a car at Edmonton. And then I realized that, you know, being able to cycle to work was a privilege, and I lived in the core, and so I should take advantage of that. And so I biked to work a lot, and and I was just it was just like a not a fun experience, you know. At the time, Edmonton didn't have any cycling infrastructure. And I'd have a, a bad experience almost every day with someone not seeing me, someone just being outwardly violent with their vehicle. And so I was kind of getting angrier and angrier. And what happened was the city was holding consultations for the development of bike lanes. And it, when their capital budget came up for this one bike lane on the downtown core, which is really necessary because there's a lot of cyclists that live downtown and the, that corridor wasn't safe for them. They actually didn't prioritize this bike lane in the budget. And it was astounding because of the work that they put into doing consultation. And then they just, whoever made the budget just decided, you know, we're going to prioritize this low enough on the list that it's probably not going to get built. And so I saw this call of a, from a community group to, they were like, they were like we got to do something about this. We need to tell the city that we want this bike lane here. So I showed up at this meeting with people who at the time I didn't know and since then have become friends with. And we're trying to brainstorm, like, how do we get the city's attention? Like, do we host a rally? Should we, like, have, like, any PR campaigns? And at that same time, on social media, I saw this pop-up bike lane that happened in Minnesota or Minneapolis, I think. And it was, like, a block. And it just they just used some pylons and some flower pots and created some space for cyclists. And... I was like, oh my God, like we got to do a pop-up bike lane. It's it's literally everything that we want. It's going to get us some coverage in the media. It's essentially a rally, you know, it'll be a bike rally. And it's just, a, it's also like a, a way for residents to experience like something tangible, you know, for, for the people that might've had an issue with the bike lane in their community, they could see what it could actually be like. Because when, it, when it's in your head, I guess, if you live in a community and you're opposed to it, all you see is something that's going to create traffic problems. And it also gave the, the cyclists something to see, like, this is what it could be like biking on a street with a bike lane. So together with this group, we organized, I think it's probably one of the longest pop-up bike lanes I've heard of. I originally wanted to do one block, but Michael Fair, who was one of the key organizers in this, he's a monster in Edmonton for a number of terms and at this time was retired. He's like, no, let's, let's go big. So we went 10 city blocks. We bought a bunch of flower pots. We got pylons. We worked with the city on it with this. It wasn't this gorilla thing, which I think there's value to, but we wanted them on our side. We didn't want to just make them mad. And so anyways, we worked with the city. We, we, we got a permit for it. It lasted all of like two hours, but it was amazing. There were kids biking on it. You know, what ended up, we ended it off with a barbecue. It turned into a community event. And so for less than a thousand dollars and for in less than two hours, we were able to communicate something. We were able to show people what it could be like. And politicians came out to it and they ended up, you know, reprioritizing their budget. And now that's being built. But in downtown Edmonton, they rolled out a pilot bike lane grid within three months this summer. And I never would have thought that was possible. So things like this, I think, can help galvanize energy and gain momentum and then you know a couple of years later it turns into a full bike lane network in downtown Edmonton. You have described uh, anti-bike lane anti-bike laners whatever the <laughs> word is for them as anti-vaxxers as, as equivalent to anti-vaxxers. Yeah. Uh, can you go through that analogy? Yeah you know um, I was really racking my brain on how to communicate how silly I thought it was that cities are so slow to move on building bike lanes. You know, I mean, and just from a strict straight up bike lanes save lives, you know, because they create separation between drivers and cyclists and then minimize the the collisions that could cause a cyclist who's not surrounded in a metal box some harm. But other studies are showing that cycling like has effects on cancer and mental health and chronic health issues. And you know, and I see politicians talk about how they want healthy cities. And I'm like, give me a break, like build some bike lanes, you know, like what, what more do you need? And I was like, how can I use a metaphor to convey how simple of a decision it could be? And also how ludicrous some of the people who oppose bike lanes are. And so 
you know, I'm also, you know, working in neuroscience and working in healthcare. I've seen, I just understand, I appreciate the value of evidence-based science and where I'm not trying to belittle people or make fun of them. Anti-vaxxers can sometimes be pretty extreme and vaccines have been proven scientifically to save lives and they've been adopted widely across the world. And, and, and there, there isn't a big consultation process about vaccines. They, they believe the experts, the experts being doctors. And I was like, what would, it, what would it be like for us to take the same process that we apply to building bike lanes, having like a five-year consultation, humming and hawing about it, about like, how would we respond if people did that with vaccines that are saving lives like all over the world? And so that's basically, that was basically like my, my concept was we know it saves lives. It's not going to cost you too much money. And anyone that opposes it just probably isn't the most rational person. I've heard it. I'm sure you've heard it. People talking about their frustrations with cyclists on the road when they're driving and joking about adoring somebody or, you know, 10 points for hitting a cyclist, that kind of thing. Does that not scare you hearing that sort of talk and uh, and being a cyclist, someone dedicated to cycling and and hearing those kinds of things? Yeah, I, I, I don't understand it. You know, I I don't know why and I think this is particularly a North American issue I did some traveling in Europe in April and May and got to see what how Europeans function <laughs> it's a little better than here they've got their issues too but when it comes to cycling they, have, they do things a bit better over there but it seems that in North America we overly identify with the way we move you know and you I mean you look at car culture you look at how cars are used as status symbols it's not surprising that people there's this kind of like separation between cyclists and drivers and and what terrifies me about it is if i as a cyclist i get mad the worst thing i could do is like kick your car to let you know that i'm there and it won't even damage it Mm -hmm. i've had drivers swerve at me you know angrily swerve at me and the more i learn about neuroscience and the more i learn about like how we our brain works the more i'm convinced that we probably shouldn't even be driving cars because we make split second decisions um we're just now we're more and more distracted um hopefully you know autonomous cars are going to come in and i'm sure they, they're going to be coming with their own risks but i'm actually kind of excited for that because i don't think that i don't trust people behind the the wheel of what is could be seen as a giant weapon you know and so yeah to answer your question i think it's terrifying I have hope that people are better than that, but I've had experiences that would tell me otherwise. And so I just try to stay vigilant. And that's why, again, I'm like such a huge advocate for bike lanes because until we figure out how to change people from being angry and using their cars as weapons, we can at least have something that physically separates from them. You mentioned being in Europe earlier in the year and you were part of a conference, a cycling conference in Russia. You were talking about cycling through winter. And I think that's often an argument that people bring up, uh, especially here in Canada, as to maybe why we don't prioritize lanes, that it's seen as a finite season. But you would argue otherwise. Tell me why. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I I remember, so my my steps in becoming a year-round cyclist, I guess, went from being terrified to even bike at all in Edmonton to then realizing that I could perhaps bike in the winter and I felt it out. Like I didn't do it my first time. I thought it was, I thought just biking alone was kind of uh, a heroic kind of experience for myself. And I kind of capped it at that, but I just, I realized, um, so what happened was I stopped biking in the winter and then, you know, I drove to work and I'd show up to work like groggy. Like I wasn't feeling well. Whereas when I biked to work, I was, you know, during the summer months and in the fall months, I just showed up fresh and I, I had so much more energy, you know? And so I was like, why not just try it in the winter? And I knew there was a growing faction of winter cyclists in Edmonton. And I just decided to learn about it. I bought an old beat up mountain bike. I put some studded tires on it and it was like the most fun I've ever had. It's obviously still, there's some dangers. It could, you can slip, but with studded tires and, and with bike lanes that, you know, you might again, protect you from cars. Like it can be a really, a really awesome experience. And it's funny how Canada is like a winter country. People pride themselves on like loving hockey and skiing and snowboarding. And we do all these sports outside. We go tobogganing. But when it comes to biking, people are like, no, I don't know why you, do, why you bike in the winter. It's well, well, you spend a day on the slopes and you don't complain about that. A half an hour bike to work shouldn't be this revolutionary idea. And it shouldn't be seen as crazy. I mean, it's something that is just as rational as 
flinging yourself down a mountain, you know, on a, on a <laughs> snowboard, right? Perhaps more rational. It's a way to get to work. And so I got involved like that in, in, in Kitchener. I've been year on cycling. But something that I really loved was when I was at the, the winter cycling or I was at the winter cycling conference in Montreal and also when I was in, the, uh, in Russia for, their, for the Moscow International Cycling Conference, I met a guy named Pekka who is from Oulu, Finland. And like it's winter there like all the time, I think. And they've got bike lanes there. And uh, like they have a huge mode share for people that cycle year round. And it's not this big deal. Like that's just how people choose to get around. And when you think about it, like I'm more terrified of driving a car in icy conditions than I am with riding a bike because I've flown through an intersection before after I've slammed my brakes. You know, you're driving this two ton piece of metal, like bad things can happen. So what I learned through biking in the winter was it is actually, I felt safer and more confident biking around. And, and I think we slowly have to change that. And if Canada wants to be a country that embraces winter, then embrace it in all its forms. And, and, and that includes how you move around. I mean, it's one thing to say Canada is a winter country. Denmark is also a, a winter country. Yeah. <laughs> then Copenhagen is one, seen as one of the models for cycling. Just a different way of thinking of things. I think this kind of goes back to the idea of viewing cities as how can we make these for people and not make these for driving through. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I think a lot changes when you get out of your car. And I've known that, you know, since moving to Kitchener, before moving here, I sold my car that I bought when I was in Edmonton. And yes, cities aren't spaces to drive through and they're not places to park, you know, and I think they're increasingly being seen as that perhaps because we have growing suburbs, which is understandable. I don't think suburbs are bad places, but if you can make a city a place where you can take pause, if you can make a city a place where you're not stressed out while you walk through it, all those things add up, you know, and I think as we have more people living in cities, we have to think about how the stress of existing in them is bad for our health. You know, there's lots of stress related health issues. And so that's one thing to consider. And yeah, I mean, I was in Berlin and I was in Copenhagen and even in like London, you know, you realize, um, or to be honest, when I was in Moscow, I mean, that's a huge city. It's, it's chaos, you know, and, and I was talking with someone from the UN who was working in Russia, in Moscow, to address greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, there was a time a couple of years ago, even in, I think it was in St. Petersburg, where people weren't allowed to be in the city because the smog got so bad, you know? So you see what it can get like, and you see where we're at here. And I think there's a bit of an arrogance that we have with how we build our cities. We think where it's always going to be okay. And, and, you know, we've got all this space. There's all this green space. We can just knock, you know, knock these trees over and build more housing and expand and expand and expand. The politicians and the people that make these decisions need to go to places where they're, they're now they're dealing with people not being able to be in the city because they can't breathe the air. You know, so, yeah, we have to get over this car-centric understanding of cities. If not for our physical health... Uh, from the perspective of walking and cycling, but if not, of just being able to breathe the air. You know, climate change is happening. So these cities, particularly in North America, that were built around the car need to be a bit smarter about how they build out. You're going to Burning Man later this summer, yeah. and uh, perhaps another great example of, of what uh, building a place for people can be like. You went last year. What was it like? Yeah, you know, I never thought I would be what I understood was what a burner was. <laughs> You know, I remember being like five years ago, I was at a bar and some guy said, oh man, I just got back from Burning Man. And I was like, whoa, you know, that guy's like a hippie. You know, I just judged him. Like I, at the time, a, a judgy person, I guess. I don't know. And so last summer, I just wanted to catch up with a really good friend of mine. And, you know, I was sort of trying to make travel plans and I wanted to go visit him. And he's like, hey, I'm going to Burning Man. And I'm like, okay, can I come to Burning Man with you? And I didn't really know anything about it. I thought it was like a music festival, you know, in the desert. And which is not it's not that and it was a profound amazing experience and i'm really lucky that i'm really fortunate to have been able to gone especially given what i'm studying i'm studying cities and how they make you feel burning man's a temporary city Eighty thousand people show up in the middle of nowhere in the desert where nothing can really live and they create the most vibrant place on earth and it's teeming with life where life can exist and yeah you know it it actually came at a time for me where I was feeling a little disenchanted with people, you know, and a lot of 
Not much has changed. <laughs> I don't think I anticipated what would happen in this past year. We should, he shall remain unnamed. But, you know, it, I was just feeling a little hopeless when it came to people and the horrible things they could do to each other. And when I went to Burning Man, everyone was just really nice, you know, and there were people of all, there were kids there, there were older adults, there were people of all backgrounds just coming together and living peacefully and joyfully for like a week. And so I thought I'd come back like completely just exhausted from being in a dusty desert for a week, but I came back rejuvenated and that stuck with me. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to go back at the end of August and just again, witness what people can create when they're intentional. And something that I kind of thought about was if we can, if, if the people can create that environment with like nothing in the middle of the desert, like what are we capable of in cities where we have all the resources to do amazing things, you know? And, and there was something about the whimsy and the playfulness that existed there that I think that we could probably learn from when it comes to the cities that we build and the art that we put out in public spaces. And, and so, yeah, it's just a super inspiring experience. And it's not for everyone, but I think anyone who has the inclination to go should because it's just a wonderful time. What I think interests me maybe most about the work that you do and the things that you have done is exemplifying the idea that no matter how small one person might be or how insignificant you might feel, you can still make a difference. You don't have to be an elected official. You don't have to be an executive. You don't have to be in a position of traditional power. You can, all it really takes is a person with an idea and the drive to to do something about it, whether that would be something like uh, installing lights in libraries or uh, creating a pop-up bike lane. Where do you get that from? Um, I probably my parents, you know, they're immigrants. Uh, they've both gone through their own hardships. Like my dad, when he was like 19, fought in a civil war, lived in a refugee camp, came to Canada, became a professor and made the life that I've been able to have the privilege of, you know, I've been, I've benefited from his tenacity. And my mom too, you know, she came to Canada as a teenager to like a small town as like the only Indian family, you know? And, and so I think, and growing up, my dad, like, really made it very clear to me that I could do anything that I wanted. You know, I just had to put my mind to it. And so I honest to God, I don't know. I just I just think anything is literally possible. Like, anything you want to do is possible. I mean, with a few exceptions, I don't think I can go to the moon anytime soon. But, you know, I, I think when it comes to the goals that you have or the dreams that you have is just – you just got to make it happen. And, and I think with intention and, and the right resources, I'm like, I'm, I come from, a, I guess, a relatively privileged perspective. I've had the ability to go to school and, and get my needs met in that capacity. But yeah, and I think when it comes to cities, like, and something that was, I was reminded of when I was at Burning Man, one of the tenets of Burning Man is, is, is civic engagement and not this passive participation. Like you have, you participate in your, in your environment there and you can make it, you literally make it what you want. And Sometimes I worry that people assume, A, they assume that politicians are just like, it's like a popularity contest. They're just like cool people that like, you know, say fun, like interesting things and they're hip or whatever. I don't know. It's just this kind of celebrity complex, I think, that people kind of project onto politicians sometimes. And I think they need to remember that they have agency and these people are there in those positions to represent them. And that any power that these decision makers have is the power that we give them. And so accordingly, like, use your voice. Like, you know, I mean, I, most of the time, I, I'm sure people are tired of the stuff I tweet about. I'm just constantly complaining about <laughs> urban infrastructure, you know, and I'm sure I've been, I'm, on a, I'm on a few mute lists. But I, th- I think if I, if, for me, any platform that I have, I try to use to like bring attention to something. And I think ultimately that drive comes from the fact that I recognize that most people may not recognize they have that agency and some people just don't have that agency. And, and uh, I've always wanted to advocate for the marginalized and the vulnerable and anything that I do when it comes to cities, complaining about bike lanes or walkability is thinking about the most vulnerable in our society. And I can't remember who said it, but they said that a measure of a society is how they treat their most vulnerable. And I think that's what really drives me to, to do what I do. We've talked a lot about cities and, and building places and, and a lot about maybe how it could be done better. What about uh, the potential you see in, in what a place can be like, how we might aspire towards something? 
Yeah. So, you know, something that I reflected on when I was in Europe, um, in cities like Copenhagen and, and Denmark, and even in St. Petersburg, they have streets that are that we that we call human scale. You know, they they're really narrow streets. They're not these huge freeways that we see these urban freeways we see in North American cities. And so, I, my first response was, I felt a little dejected. I was like, oh my gosh, like what are we, what are like, how can we even compete with this? But then I when I came back here, I see space. You know, I see I see we we actually have something to work with. So we can take what they're doing in Copenhagen and we can take what they're doing, you know, in Sweden and come back here and use the abundance of space that we have on our roads to put bike lanes in. So when I look at a city like Kitchener, you know, I I live on Weber Street and it's a four lane highway in the middle of a neighborhood. While it can be daunting and terrifying to bike down, I'm like, we could easily take a lane out of traffic here. They made this space. They literally widened the street for cars. Why don't we take a lane of that and turn it into a two-way bicycle track? You know what's stopping us? We have, we have opportunity. And while North America, you know, Canadian cities are relatively babies when you compare them to like these urbanist meccas across the pond, we have the gift of retrospect and the ability to take ideas from places and do them maybe even better. So yeah, I think when it comes to changing Canadian cities, particularly, there's lots of potential because we have a lot of space, you know, and and we have resources and we have the gift of, you know, the Internet where you can see how people all around the world do things. Thanks a lot. It's really nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you. That's it for the show. Thanks for listening, and I hope you liked it. If you want to know more about Robin, head to his website, Robin Mazumder. If you enjoyed the show, you can do me a favor and hit subscribe. It's on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. You can also help me out by leaving a rating and review too, or pass it along to someone you think might enjoy it. The next episode will come in September. I'm off for two weeks in Iceland and Norway. The music for the show by Dr. Turtle off the album You Um, I'll Ah. I'm Martin Bauman, and this was The Story Untold. See you next time. (laughs) 